at a crucial moment may mar the entire outcome of a life. Failure at a crucial moment may mar the entire outcome of a life. That is one of the most striking quotes by Charles Spurgeon I've ever had the privilege of hearing or reading. But it's true. In the 2024 Republican presidential debate of a few weeks ago, when each candidate was asked about their position on the issue of abortion, former Vice President Mike Pence had this to say. After I gave my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I opened up the book and I read, Before I formed you in in the womb, I knew you. And see, I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. That sounds pretty good so far. I should have a candidate who's willing to open up the word of God and bring it to bear on this issue that has plagued our nation for decades. Let's see how well he does if we keep going. And I knew from that moment on the cause of life had to be my cause. And I've been a champion for life in the Congress, a champion for life as a governor, and as vice president. Wow. Amazing. He goes on to say, and to be honest with you, Nikki, one of the other candidates, you're my friend, but consensus is the opposite of leadership. Amen to that. I agree with that. He says, but when the Supreme Court returned this question to the American people, they didn't just send it to the states only. It's not a states only issue. It's a moral issue. And I promise you, as President of the United States, the American people will have a champion for life in the Oval Office. Well, great. What's your plan? He says, can't we have a minimum standard in every state in the nation that says, when a baby is capable of feeling pain... An abortion cannot be allowed. A 15-week ban is an ideal whose time has come. It's hard to hear that because the majority of abortions all happen before 15 weeks anyway. But it gets worse. Remember what he said, consensus is the opposite of leadership. He says, a 15-week ban is ideal whose time has come. It's supported by 70% of the American people, but it's going to take... But wait a minute. Consensus is the opposite of leadership, but he appeals to a consensus. It's going to take unapologetic leadership, leadership that stands on principle. This is absolutely hilarious. (laughs) And expresses compassion to women in crisis. If only we had someone who is actually willing to stand on biblical principle and the word of God, not a consensus. Failure at a crucial moment may mar the entire outcome of a life. Not just the life of the person who failed to stand, but also those they had the opportunity to protect. In this case, any baby under the 15-week ban, if this man is elected, will be killed. Just to clarify, none of the candidates on that stage are willing to stand on actual biblical principle to protect all the babies from the moment of fertilization. What a failure. These are supposedly the champions for life. Well, today we're going to look at the importance of not being like them. We're going to look at the importance of having a face like flint. A flint is a very hard and dark rock. But in the Bible, the idea of having a face like flint can be defined this way. And if you're taking notes, I I encourage you to write this down. A face like flint can be defined this way. An inflexible and unwavering determination in our faithfulness to God despite difficulty. A face like flint is an inflexible and unwavering determination in our faithfulness to God despite difficulty. Do you have a face like flint. What's an example of this in the scripture? We have Ezekiel. God says to Ezekiel, but the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me, because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery harder than flint have I made your forehead. Fear them not, nor be dismayed 
at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. That's Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. So in the midst of a culture that is unyielding and stubborn in their wickedness, God makes and sends people who are unyielding and stubborn in their faithfulness. Do you have a face like flint? Can you be described as a person who has an inflexible and unwavering determination in your faithfulness to God despite immense difficulty? Many of you probably are already there, but please turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1. I'm just going to give a little bit of the context. We thank you, John, for reading that chapter for me. This is a defining moment in the history of the people of Israel. The split of the kingdom, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Israel is now a house divided. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, now only rules under the southern kingdom of Judah. The other ten tribes in the northern kingdom of Israel, now under the rule of Jeroboam. Now the split had been prophesied to Jeroboam during the reign of Solomon. That he would rule over the ten tribes and that if he would just obey the Lord and walk in his ways, that he would be blessed. But as John read, he chose to lead Israel into gross sin of idolatry by erecting two golden calves to worship. Failure at a crucial moment may mar the entire outcome of a life. And throughout First and Second Kings, this phrase is uttered and repeated. He walked in the sin of Jeroboam. His legacy of idolatry was so strong that all the kings that came after him, that followed him, could be marked by whether they continued in his way or departed from it. Much like those buried in Angmar's grave, he will only be remembered as a servant of evil. So who will God send with a face like flint to confront this wickedness? Let's read. And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings, and the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. This is absolutely staggering to, to, the, to the Israelite mind. We know If you burn dead bones of a human being on an altar, that altar gets defiled. And the ashes have to be placed in a very specific place beside the altar. He's saying, this altar is going to split by the power of God as a sign to you that everything I just told you is true. And in the future, a man by the name of Josiah is going to take your bones that have been dead in the ground, bring them up, put them on the altar, and burn it. This is what an amazing moment, the split of the kingdom. Who is the na- what's the name of the great prophet? Have we ever heard of him? It's not Isaiah, it's not Ezekiel, it's not Elijah. They're they're not, appear to be on the scene yet. What's his name? Well, we don't know his name. His name is unknown, but he is named by what characterized his life. Man of God. What a privilege that is. Man of God. We don't know his name. This crucial moment in history, and the one God chooses to use, he doesn't reveal what his name is. I actually find that quite encouraging. Not not a big name, not one of the major prophets, not even one of the minor prophets, just man of God. It's as if this man could have been anybody. But he possessed an inflexible and unwavering determination in, in his faithfulness to God, despite the difficulty. He's going before the king. And the king has the power to destroy him. And we'll see how difficult this actually was to become in the next verse. Verse 4. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar saying, Seize him! Oh no. What does God do? And his hand which he stretched out against him dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. 
He draws forth his hand, sees him, and God withers his hand, and he can't even, can't even bring it. It's this idea of like, you, you can't move your hand apart from my power. The only reason you were able to move your hand in the first place, God is saying, is because I allowed it. He's not letting him bring it back. The altar also was torn down, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So here's the sign, the thing that I just said was going to happen to confirm that everything I told you is true. God not only withered your hand, but the sign that he said he would perform, he just did. Glory to God. Glory to God. And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord of your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. Isn't that funny? I don't know if you've been in this situation. How many times? You've been witnessing to somebody over and over and over again, and they like, I hate your Christianity. I want nothing to do with your Christianity. But as soon as someone in their family is sick, as soon as something goes wrong in their life, they're like, please entreat your God for me. And you're, you'll gladly pray. Of course you will. We're Christians, right? But when... If God in his providence heals them or fixes that situation, do they repent? Most of the time they don't. That's exactly what happened here with Jeroboam. It's exactly what, ha- it's exactly what happened. The king's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. Immediate healing. Immediate. No repentance. We know there was no repentance because of verse 33. After this, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made... Priests and high priests again from among all the people. He doesn't repent. This is an astounding account of Scripture. You might be thinking, Tyrus, I- I'm not a prophet in ancient Israel. But the first point of my message today is have a face like Flint. Have a face like Flint, like this prophet. Like this man of God, have a face like Flint. But you're saying, Tyrus, I'm not a prophet in ancient Israel. When I pray for people, most of the time, maybe this has happened to you, they don't get healed instantly. What does it look like for me? What does it look like for me to have a face like Flint? Well, it's actually, as the more I thought about this, the more I studied, it's actually not that complicated. Fear God, not man. Let's just start there. Start with the heart... Fear God, not man. I am not going to be afraid of man. Lord, I fear you. I reverence you. I respect you. I want to walk in a way that is pleasing to you because I fear you and I love you. I will fear you and I will do what you say, but I will not fear man. That's where you start. But having a face like Flint really, when it comes down to it, is just ordinary obedience. It's just ordinary obedience. To start with, it takes a face like Flint not being afraid of praying in public over your meal at work. That's what it could look like for you. You ever been in that situation, you work with unbelievers and you're all sitting down at the lunch table and you're like, you're about to eat and you know you're, you know you're supposed to pray for your meal, give thanks, eat your drink, give thanks to the Lord, but oh, I don't, uh, I don't want to come across as too super spiritual, I don't want to come across this way, and you don't pray. Now, we don't want to be like the Pharisees who made long prayers to be seen by other men. We're just talking about ordinary, like, thank you, God, for this meal. Thank you so much for providing it. Amen. For some of you, that, that could be what it means to have a face like Flint in ordinary obedience. It's just not being afraid to pray over your meal. Men, what does it look like for you to have a face like Flint? It means guarding your eyes. Guarding your eyes. I made a covenant... With you, Lord, that with my eyes that I might not look upon anything. Pornography. Having a, it takes a face like flint, unwavering, inflexible. I will not put that filth before my eyes because it displeases you. If you're married, it means having only eyes for your wife. That's what having a face like flint means in ordinary obedience. For women... It takes a face like Flint for you to guard your tongue. You're tempted to gossip. You got something really juicy. It takes a face like Flint to say, I'm just not going to share that. Your husband forgot to do the thing you told him to do 10 minutes ago. And you think, I just got to get on him. I just got to nag him over and over and over, pound it through his thick skull. I wanted this done now. 
takes a face like Flint not to do that, but to do what Peter says and win him by her conduct, speaking to him gently, softly, graciously. Children, that's right, I'm not leaving you guys out. What does it look for you to have a face like Flint? Guard your behavior. Your parents say no. And everything in your little body says, I want to do it anyway. It's going to take a face like Flint for you to say, okay, mom, okay, dad, and not do it. They ask you a question, did you do this? And you know the answer, if you answer in the affirmative, is going to get you in trouble. And the temptation for you to lie about what you've done rises up. It takes a face like Flint for you to say, I will tell the truth, even though I'll be punished. That's right, children. You can have a face like Flint, too. Tell the truth, even though it's hard. Showing kindness to your enemies. Praying for your enemies. Isn't that the example we have in the text? Actually interceding for those who are terrible to us. If the intercession of the man of God could heal the hand of a wicked king, could God not answer our prayers to heal the hearts of our wicked rulers? Of course he could. For the healing of Jeroboam's hand did not result in repentance like a healed heart would have. You know, I was listening, I can't remember the name of the pastor, but it was a short little clip from a a sermon, and it really struck me. He says, how many true Christians fast and pray? Isn't, you know, fasting and prayer, this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. That doesn't just have to do with demons. That could could mean just an extreme hardship in your life. How is it possible that we would see a greater move of God if all of God's people prayed and fasted? sought his face, would we see the Lord move? I believe we would. But that's just ordinary obedience. But this text specifically is calling us to be obedient in a very specific way, and that's the obedience in confronting. Oh, oh, that, 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 that's not the way of Christ. We don't confront anybody. <laughs> just got to be nice. The 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice. Never say anything is going to cause somebody to feel bad about themselves, about what they did, or feel like they might actually have done something wrong. That's not the Jesus of the Bible, and that's not in your Bible, by the way. There's only 10 commandments. And if you're going to follow the 10 commandments and hold people accountable, it's gonna, it means you're going to have to do quite a bit of confronting in your life. Now, this can look specifically like it is here in the text, confronting the civil magistrate. Confronting the civil magistrate, what you are doing, the laws that you are proposing, the laws that you are putting upon this people is wicked and wrong. Submit to Christ and his law. It could be advocating for the unborn, going in front of abortion clinics, crying out, don't kill your child. Repent, turn to Christ, we'll help you. That's what it could look like. Now, you might be thinking, Tyrus, I... I, I I agree with all those things, but I don't exactly have the opportunity right now, and I I don't want to condemn you for that. But what I will say is this. Paul Washer says, you either go down the well or you hold the rope for those who go down. So my question to you is, how are you supporting those who are going before that civil magistrate? How are you supporting the people that are trying to get bills in a place for equal protection for the unborn? How are you supporting them? That could look in a couple of different ways. These are just suggestions. could just be prayer. We should be praying about this anyways, but it could be your presence. It could be like, I won't be the one to speak. I saw someone uh, actually commented. They saw that I had gone before the civil magistrate advocating for the unborn, and he messaged me privately, and he said, he said, wow, that's like a really great thing that you did. And I'm like, well, you know, I, you know, I can't, all glory to God, of course, but, you know, just doing what I can to be faithful. And he said, I'm not a pastor. And I was like, well, I'm not a pastor either. <laughs> um, but he said, I don't know if I'd be willing to say that or be able to speak, but I certainly wouldn't mind coming with you. Sometimes it's just your presence. Are you willing to stand with people who are willing to do these things? You can do that. Perhaps God will lead you to speak. I hope he does. But if he doesn't, at least give your presence. Maybe it's just supporting those people financially giving money to end abortion now or abolish abortion PA, all these great ministries trying to end abortion in our country. It could look like that. 
But again, this thing of confronting, whether or not you can do those other things, there's other things that can be done. Well, speaking of pastors and elders, uh, what about this situation? Uh, elders, a uh, child wants to be baptized, but after counseling and talking and observing their life, you know they show no genuine fruit of salvation. And the parents say, well, okay, well, why aren't you baptizing my, my child? It's going to take a face like Flint for you to say to them, I'm sorry, after observing their life and after speaking with them and much prayer, I don't see any genuine fruit of salvation in their life. You know how many parents have left churches because of that? Instead of saying, oh, praise God, we have a man of God who's actually willing to examine the soul of my child and who cares enough to tell me, even though it might offend me. It's going to take a face like Flint for you to do that. It could be church discipline, which I think would be easier if there was church membership, but I'm not here to talk about that. <laughs> Regardless of how it's done, again, that's not the sermon today. Um, regardless of how it's done, but it takes a face like Flint for the elders to say, to go before you, to confront you, you've sinned, repent, and bringing others, and then eventually bringing it before the church, and then having to do the hard thing of treating them as a tax collector and a sinner excommunication. And everything in your flesh and everyone around you is going to say, this isn't loving. And then you have to remember that the most loving man who ever walked this planet, Jesus Christ, is the one who commanded us to do this. It'll take a face like Flint for you elders and pastors to do church discipline. This next one's really hard. You thought that was hard? This one's harder. Husbands, confronting your wife when she speaks like an unbeliever. You remember Job, don't you? His children were slaughtered. He's sick. There's boils on his... If, think about this for a second. Just step into Job's wife's shoes for a second. My children are dead. My husband is sick. She's angry. She's bitter. She says to him, why do you hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. What does Job do? Does he say, well, she's just speaking out of, you know, her, her pain right now, and uh, I can't really hold her accountable to those words, you know, because my wife is really emotional, and I really shouldn't do that because our emotions give us license to sin. How? What's he say to her? And I believe he did not say this in a snippet, snappy way. I believe he said it in tenderness. He says, you are speaking like a foolish woman. What's he saying? What's a fool? Well, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. He is corrupt and does terrible deeds. You're speaking like an unbeliever. He's saying, don't, don't speak this way. God is sovereign. Are we to accept the good from God, from God and not evil, not the bad? God is sovereign. He brought this into our life. I don't understand. But in the midst of our confusion and our pain, let's not blaspheme his name. It's going to take a face like Flint for you to say that to your wife. It will. Women, and some of you, if you attended the uh, conference, will know because uh, Beth uh, mentioned this in her talk. It's confronting the one lady in the women's group who slanders and mocks her husband under the guise of sharing. I'm just sharing. It was just a joke. It takes a face like Flint for you to say, I really don't think this is an appropriate way for us to speak about our husbands. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I really don't think this is appropriate. Especially if the leader of that study doesn't do it. Will you be the one to say it? This next one hits close to home for many of you. I know it does for me. Confronting a named brother, who, meaning someone who claims to be a Christian, on sin. It could be a friend. It could be a family member. You, you know, confronting the civil magistrate, that, my heart was pounding when I did that for the very first time. Thank you, Joel, for coming with me, by the way. I, just your encouragement was so helpful. But, I mean, that's hard, but it's really nothing compared to confronting a family member who claims to be a believer and is living in gross, immoral sin. You want to know why? Because I'm not going to, I don't have memories of dinners and laughter and good times with those people on the Lancaster City Council. I don't really know them. And also, 
the Lancaster City Council doesn't have a checklist of all the immoral and stupid sinful things I did 10 years ago to throw in my face. How dare you confront me on my sin? You did this. It takes a face like Flint for us to go to our friends and family members who claim to be Christians and say, I'm trying to say this as lovingly and as humble as possible, but, there, but you claim to be a Christian and the fruit of your life is the exact opposite. It's possible you never knew him. It'll take a face like Flint to do that. And of course, there's evangelism to this lost and wicked world, sharing the gospel in whatever opportunity we have with our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, all these things to share the gospel of grace. You want to face like Flint? You want to pour all your energies into doing something good? That's a great place to start. What is greatly needed in this hour are men, women, and children with faces like Flint. That's what's needed. But know that God will hold us accountable. Know that God will hold us accountable. I want to continue reading. And the king, verse 7, excuse me. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. Also, I, wanna, I think it's interesting that he never thanks God for the healing that just happened. Uh, just a side note there. And the man of God said to the king, If you give me half of your house, I will not go in with you, and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. For so was it commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Now here's where the story gets really interesting. Now an old prophet lived in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told to their father the words that he had spoken to the king. Like, Dad, you, gotta, you, you don't know what happened at the idolatrous service we just had. This guy got up, he told the king this, a withered hand. It was amazing. And so what, what happens next? Their father said to them, which way did he go? And his son showed him the way that the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he mounted it. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with you or go in with you. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there nor return by the way that you came. I just want to make a side note. Remember, God commanded him not to eat or drink anything. I got to tell you, when you do something like confronting a civil magistrate, you're really hungry afterwards. Thank you, Joel, for taking me to Chick-fil-A after it. You're really hungry. <laughs> it t you're, you're nervous as can be. Your heart's pounding. You actually get God by his Holy Spirit empowers you to actually open your mouth and speak something. You're drained afterward. You're hungry. You're thirsty. It's very possible he's going through the same thing. He's like, I really wish I could have a chicken sandwich right now. And he said to him, the old prophet, to the man of God, I also am a prophet as you are. An angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you into your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. Now, just a quick recap of what happened here. He says, I can't dine with the king. The word, word of God said, I can't do that. He says, I can't go with you for the same reason. But why did God not want him to eat or drink anything? Well, I think the New Testament actually kind of helps us with this a little bit. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, Paul says this, But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. These are the people of God. These are the people of God, the people of Israel. And they are worshiping golden calves. They become idolaters. They, in a sense, bear the name of Yahweh, and they are acting in a way that is blasphemous. And Paul says in the New Testament, and it appears here the same principle was applying, uh, I don't want you to give any legitimacy to what's going on here, so don't even eat or drink with them. 
And John goes on in his epistle, 2 John 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, meaning the true teaching of the gospel, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So it's possible, and I think it's very, very likely, that that's exactly what God is doing here. He said, this is a time of absolute spiritual compromise in the people of Israel. I have a true man of God here. Don't lend any legitimacy to anything that's going on over there. So don't eat with them. But then we got the old prophet. What's, this is the thing. What's the old prophet's deal? Like, what does he have to gain by doing this? By lying and telling the man of God to come? Well, commentators are uncertain what his motive actually was in calling him back with this deception. The theory that I'm most partial to and seems to be accurate so far as I can tell is that he was a good prophet at one time but had allowed compromise into his heart. I think he genuinely wanted to support the man of God with a meal. I actually think he did want to do that. But because he was in a culture of compromise and became compromised himself, he took no issue lying to bring about, in his mind, a kindness. Uh, uh, Again, commentators are very split. Is this guy a good guy, a bad guy? Well, How do we look at this? John Gill's commentary says this. It is hard to say what he was, a good man or a bad man. If a good man, he was guilty of many things which are not in his favor. As dwelling in such an idolatrous place, suffering his sons to attend idolatrous worship, and telling the man of God a premeditated lie. So those are all the categories. This is a bad guy. This is a bad guy. But then he goes on, John Gill goes on to say, and yet there are several things which seem contrary to his being a bad man and of an ill character since he is called an old prophet. So he's he's called a prophet. He also did not attend idolatrous worship. This is interesting that John Gill points this out. He said the old prophet didn't go to the idolatrous worship services. It seems like he knows, I don't want anything to do with that. But he lets his sons go. So he showed a little bit of compromise. Like, well, I'm not going to go, but I'm not going to stop my sons from going. But John Gill goes on to say he showed great respect to the man of God. There's other things that John Gill says in favor of him being a good man but compromised, but I'm not going to share it now because um, uh, concerning that because it would give away the rest of the narrative concerning this character. But what are we learning here? Well, well, first of all, have you not seen this? Someone who was so passionate for the Lord, had a great life for the Lord, but they get old, they get tired, and they begin to be less strict about things. Let things slide. Yeah, in my young youth and my zeal, I was more passionate about following this particular command of Scripture, but I'm tired now. It's very possible that's, that's what's going on here. And now he is even compromised. A prophet is compromised telling the truth. That, that's, that's big deal. But an application we can get from this is don't blindly trust religious authority. Don't blindly trust a religious authority, regardless of their good intentions, because it can lead to devastating consequences. Uh, we were listening to a Paul Washer sermon on Nicole and I, and uh, it's just, I, I, I must have heard that sermon so many times, but it's amazing how much a religious lie has so much power. How many people are walking in immorality and sin, and when you go to them and actually confront them on their salvation, they say, well, the preacher told me I'm saved, because after I said the sinner's prayer, he kept me up on the altar and said, welcome to the family of God. A religious lie can have a lot of power. And, and ministers who do that, I believe they genuinely think this is the most loving thing to do. It doesn't matter what their good intentions are. The question is, is it what God said? But don't blindly trust religious authority regardless of their good intentions. Because devastating things can happen, and we're going to see that in the text going forward. And as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet, the old man, who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment that the Lord your God commanded you, but have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, eat no bread and drink no water, your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. In ancient Israel, that's a big deal. Being buried with your ancestors, it's a big deal. And God's saying, because you disobeyed me, I'm not even going to let you be buried with them. And after he had eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was thrown in the road, and the donkey stood beside it. The lion also stood beside the body. 
And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown in the road and the lion standing by the body. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. This is really, I, I picked this text to preach months ago. And this is really what struck me. It, it's so, tr- failure at a crucial moment may mar the entire outcome of a life. When we read this text, though, there's this inevitable burning question. I know you're thinking it. I know I was thinking it. I know it made me reread the passage over and over because I can't believe that God would do this. The question is, God, why him? If you're going to kill somebody, why don't you kill the wicked king who's in power right now? Why don't you kill this prophet who lied to this faithful man of God and tricked him into doing this? Why would you do this? And it appears I'm not the only one who has read this text and felt that way. Because Matthew Henry says this. Matthew Henry, we may wonder that the wicked prophet went unpunished, while the holy man of God was suddenly and severely punished. What shall we make of this? What's he saying? He's like, how do we reconcile this? How do we understand this? This is what Matthew Henry says. The judgments of God are beyond our power to fathom. They're beyond our comprehension. He says, I don't know why. I don't know. They're beyond our power to fathom, and there is a judgment to come. Nothing can excuse any act of willful disobedience. He goes on to say, God is displeased at the sins of his own people, and no man shall be protected in his disobedience. By his office, his nearness to God, or any services he has done for him, God warns all whom he employs strictly to observe their orders. Isn't this such a, basically what Matthew Henry is saying is what error God ordains is right. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. They are. We don't understand them. We don't know. But God's discipline of his people can be severe. That's such important for us to remember. It can be severe. Uh, you, you've read 1 Corinthians 11, 27, 32, concerning communion and all these things. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning of the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And this is, and, and if Paul stopped there, okay, but he goes on to say in verse 30, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. This is the New Testament. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Here's our problem. Our problem is we really don't believe God disciplines his people. We really don't believe that. If we're being honest, most of the time, we really don't believe. If we were on the boat with Jonah and he said, God's punishing me right now, you know what we'd say? Uh, (laughs) Jonah, it's just a coincidence. Please, please don't be so hard on yourself. How many of us would actually say that? And we might be saying, but he just did this great thing for God. Why, God, would you do this? It's not enough that you were faithful in the past. You must continue on. You must continue on, even if the past was 10 minutes ago. Don't allow yourself to be deceived into sin, even by well-meaning Christian leaders. You know, Charles Thomas Studd, author of The Chocolate Soldier or Heroism, The Lost Court of Christianity. The Chocolate Soldier, I just need to explain that for a minute. Chocolate Soldier, he's not talking about black Christians, by the way. Um, (laughs) Chocolate Soldier, he's contrasting the chocolate soldier with the true Christian heroic soldier. The one who is faithful to God despite immense difficulty and the chocolate soldier is the Christian who capitulates and and melts before opposition, like chocolate before a furnace. And concerning this text, he says this, many fine youngsters are turned into chocolates by old prophets. Old prophets who have lost their fire. And he goes on to say, that poor young prophet, he did so well when he obeyed God only Isn't that true? He did so well when he obeyed God only. Wasn't listening to older men in the previous chapter a good thing, Rehoboam? 
But he goes on to say this, and this is what really caught me about this quote. The floor of Christendom and elsewhere is littered with wrecks made by old prophets. People who are once faithful, they're old, they're tired, they begin to capitulate and compromise. And what do they do when they teach someone who's younger than them? They begin to br- their compromises into them, even though th- those young people may have started well. And the floor of Christendom is littered with people like that, who have been made b- that way by old prophets. But the, uh, have a face like Flint was my first point. The second point is this, how do you keep a face like Flint? How do you keep a face like Flint? Uh, now, I didn't say, now, how do you get one, but how do you keep one? Because it, it's not enough to have one. It's not enough just to, to get, I mean, to get one. You've you got to be able to keep it. How do you do that? You know, there's much talk today in the church about true masculinity, and that's an awesome and good thing. I'm so happy we're talking about that. In fact, the other Sunday when we were all here lifting weights with Conrad, and I dropped a weight on my foot, and I limped for like two weeks, like that, yeah, that hurts uh, still <laughs> a little bit, uh, but that, that's a good thing. You know, see, all the, all the women are praying over the sister who's about to give birth, and over here all the brothers are here, and their children are cheering them on like, go, dad, go, 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 carry the weights. That's an awesome thing that, that we should celebrate in Christianity. Men being truly masculine for the glory of God. However, I, I want to give this warning. If you're putting your trust in your manliness, or just if you're a man or woman, if you're putting your trust in the power of the flesh, get ready for Jesus to serve you some humble pie. And it's going to happen. We, we need to get this. Uh, we need to understand this. We must be fully dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit. Fully dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit. And I will not give that up even though you accuse me of being charismatic. Fully dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot trust in the arm of the flesh to do this or to make this happen. It's not going to happen unless the Spirit of God opens the hearts of those we speak to, nothing's going to happen. We need to be fully convinced we can accomplish absolutely nothing apart from the power of the Spirit. You know, I was, I was reading a conversation in a group chat, and uh, this man was saying all these great things that he wants to do for the kingdom of God. All these great things, and it was awesome, all the things that he wanted to do, and all the support that he wanted to get. But he said this, after he had posted that, the next one said this, I don't want to sound pietistic, but I really think we need to pray more. That broke my heart. Pietism is the death of many things, the death of many legitimate things, keeping our faith to ourselves. That's the death of many things. But I submit to you, when the phrase, we should pray more, sounds too pietistic, that's a problem. That's a major problem. It's prayer. How many strongholds? Now, again, Not just prayer. I'm not saying just pray. I'm saying, but in our zeal to build the kingdom, if we say, yeah, we're going to confront the civil magistrate, yeah, we're going to preach the gospel, we're going to hit the streets, if we are not powered by the Holy Spirit through dependence and prayer, I don't think we'll actually accomplish very much. In fact, I know we won't. So prayer and dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit. And this next one, again, I will not apologize for this, even though it may, to our ears, sound pietistic. I do not care. It is biblical. Intimacy with Christ. We cannot advance the kingdom. We will not do it effectively unless we have a strong intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. Intimacy with Christ will make betraying his word unthinkable because we recognize we're not just betraying a rule or a principle, but a person. When we sin, when we capitulate, when we compromise, it's not just that we fail to live up to the biblical principle. No, we betray Jesus Christ. And we will not feel that way if we do not have a strong intimacy with him. How do you, if, you, if you've observed adultery, how does it start? Well, it usually starts as a result of the lack of intimacy and passion a spouse has towards their marital relationship. And no, I'm not talking about the physical. I'm talking about just in the heart. They begin saying, you know, I'm not really that happy. This over here looks pretty good. That's how it's... Now, it may lead into the physical lacking intimacy, but I'm saying it starts in the heart of just 
just having the thought, this isn't as good as I want it to be. And how many marriages would still be saved if they cultivated intimacy and passion for their spouse? But in the same way, if we want to be effective out there, if we want to build the kingdom of God, we must be empowered by intimacy with Christ so that we do not capitulate. And that is the best way to have a face like Flint. But, but what if you fail? What, what if you fail? You know, this is really important. How do we keep a face like Flint? We need to have one. But, but what if you fail? Can grace be found for me if you failed? Well, surely there's no grace in this text, is there? Let me comfort you, believers. Verse 26, and when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard of it, he said, it is the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him according to the word that the Lord spoke to him. And he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it. And he went and found his body thrown in the road and the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body or torn the donkey. This is amazing. This lion, who definitely was more hungry than the prophet was after confronting the king, only did what God commanded of that lion. He did not consume the body of the man of God. He didn't even kill his donkey. It's still there. God only punished as much as was necessary for his own. And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to the city to mourn and to bury him. God even used the discipline of his own to bring another to repentance. Now, I don't have to tell you that I would rather someone be brought to repentance by my obedience than by my chastisement. But nevertheless, is this not a grace that even our blunders can be used by God to bring about repentance in others? That does not mean we should seek to have them. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. But even that is a grace. And he laid the body in his own grave and they mourned over him saying, alas, my brother. Alas, my brother. Almost as if, what have I done to you, my brother? It's my fault that this happened. And after he had buried him, he said to his sons, when I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. I want to identify with this man who was faithful for the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord according, uh, uh, sorry, against the altars in Bethel and against all the house of the high places that are in the city of Samaria shall surely come to pass. I want to be identified with him and I know that I know that I know that everything he said is going to come to pass. It's going to happen. God will be faithful in his word that he spoke through this man of God. Despite his moment of failure, Though his name is unknown, he was named by what characterized his whole life. Man of God. When the prophecy was fulfilled by King Josiah in 2 Kings 23, verse 17, Josiah, then he said, Josiah, what is that monument I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and predicted these things that you have done against the altar at Bethel. And he said, let him be. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone. Oh, there could have been a fear. Oh, oh God, I prophesied that the the bones of these false priests would be burned on the altar. I prophesied that. And now that I'm not going to be buried in the tomb of my fathers, is that what's going to happen to me? No. No. God was even gracious after death. A true man of God can have a moment of failure. I really want you to see this. A true man of God can have a moment of failure. But when he does, if given the opportunity, what should that man of God do? I want to share something. Um, A couple weeks back, we had a baptismal service. And I was speaking with a pastor, and we're having a great conversation. I noticed that my wife had been in the food line, you know, we're having a potluck. 
and, uh, and we, we got so much in conversation that I didn't join my wife right away, and I saw that she was there, and so I said, I'll, I'll, I'll just join her. But then I realized I cut a front of very, uh, at least uh, 12 or more hang- hungry men. Uh, <laughs> and I, I was like, wait a minute, I probably shouldn't have done that, even if I wanted to be with my wife. And so I turned to the older prophet, Luke Saint. I was like, well, you know the, you know the law of God when it comes to church potlucks. Um, did I just do something wrong? And he said, that depends, young one. Um, are you, if you take something that I want on that plate, then we'll convict. Then you might have done something wrong. So I sit down and everything's fine. But then the prophet... Dave Stolfus came to me and said, I know what you did. You cut. You cut. And when I repented in sackcloth and ashes, he just laughed his head off. So if you were behind me, I want to apologize, truly. I, I, I'm sorry. It will not happen again. <laughs> that really has been bothering me for weeks, by the way. I'm glad I got to share that. Um, that's not actually the story I want to share. Um, When the man of God fails, what should he do? I asked Joel if this would be appropriate for me to share, if it would be helpful. He said, yeah. When I was a student at Lancaster Bible College and I graduated, I had been the student body chaplain. I had the homiletics award for preaching, the student leadership award, all these awards. And you know what? None of it amounted to anything when 2020 happened. None of it. I wasn't, I wasn't in those elder meetings. I wasn't an elder. I wasn't a pastor at the time. But, so I want to be careful I speak about this, but they, they, they shut down the church. Yeah. And I struggled because I had not, I thought, well, being faithful and being reformed all that, you really just have to know reformed theology in regards to soteriology, meaning the doctrine of salvation. That's all you need to know. I never thought about developing my theology of government, my theology of this and that. None of that. And so I'm in a situation unprecedented by my standards. Again, in history, it had happened before, but I never heard about anything like that. And I was looking for guidance, and I was struggling. I remember having long conversations with my wife. I'm like, Hebrews says we're not supposed to neglect the gathering, but all I'm hearing from T4G, the Gospel Coalition, um, many of these I don't listen to or read anymore, and you really shouldn't, um, but... John MacArthur is, this is unprecedented. Even John MacArthur, and again, I, again, I, I want to be careful to speak respectfully. I, I'm glad that he opened back up, but initially, he closed. So I'm thinking, I'm a young guy. I'm still, in, I'm still learning how to do this in college. I don't know as much as these elderly men who know the Bible, who've been reformed far longer than me, what we're supposed to do in this situation. I'm struggling with what I see in the text, and the men that I wanted to hear from were either silent or they just ignored the issue altogether. What do I do? By God's grace, eventually, my pastor said in passing, he's like, at what point are we prioritizing physical health over spiritual health? And so we open back up. And I'm glad that happened, and we even had a sermon series about how essential the church is. Praise God for that. But I was like, I learned, like, that shouldn't have happened. There's sins of commission and there's sins of omission. Like, I didn't make the decision, but I had doubts in my understanding and didn't say anything. And I'm like, I'm glad we're on this track now, but, and I was still developing, I still didn't fully understand, but this 2020 opened up a lot of things, and then, of course, the critical race theory and all that stuff happened, and then I was forced to confront, does the Bible have something to say about all this? And when I discovered that it did, and God showed me in the Word, and I began proclaiming that, and I saw the good fruit of that, I realized, you know, we always say the Bible applies to everything, but I'm realizing we don't really apply it to everything. And so now I'm in a situation where I see, no, God actually has something to say about politics, government, all this stuff that I didn't know. And the, the Romans 13 interpretation that I just took at, for granted because that's what I was told all my life, turns out that years ago, all these reformed men of the past, they didn't even believe that. And so what do I do? Well, I'm speaking out against critical race theory. You, you be faithful with what you've been given, but then, you know, we're meeting again, but, you know, we're going back inside and we're, we're going to ask people to wear masks. Mm-hmm. 
And again, that struggle happened where I'm like, I'm not, I'm not sure about this. I don't know. But I'm like, we're gathering with the saints. We're taking the Lord's Supper. We're, we're singing to the Lord. We're, we're hearing the word preached. That's what we need. So I guess I'm willing to, to do that, to do what I have to do to, in my eyes, be faithful. But there were certain other people that didn't feel that way. There were certain other people that showed up to services. They, they didn't put a mask on. And I didn't fully understand. I was like, yeah, we're not asking. I was like, again, I didn't make the decision to do this, but I'm just like, I, I don't know. And, and of course, when they say ask you, you can sit in the service and not wear one, but after the service, get ready, because one of the leadership is going to come talk to you. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm struggling with this. And people left. And then I realized, <laughs> you never had the authority to do that. You never had the authority to force people to do that. So what do you do? Well, you keep being faithful. Eventually, they they kick you out. but, um, uh, But what do I do now? There's people that I I didn't make the decision, but there's people I wanted to stand up for who, who didn't get the chance. And so you, you find those people. You talk to them and you say, hey, I know I didn't make the decision. And I know that I was ignorant to these things, but I'm not ignorant now, and I'm sorry. Yeah. And then they'll say things like, oh, Tyrus, we're not mad at you. you, you. No, I'm like, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. The first day of church here, when we came here, I saw one of the families who left that church. Uh-huh. And I said, I'm sorry. And they said the same thing, Tyrus, we're not mad at you. And I was like, no, I, I'm sorry. I won't reveal who those people are. They can identify themselves if they wish, um, but that's all. You you repent, and you be faithful from that moment forward, and then you you find people who have a face like Flint and desire to have a face like Flint who will hold you accountable. You start going to the church of the most hated pastor in Lancaster County, (laughs) who's going to hold you accountable. You're going to sit yourself under elders who are like, we're going to evaluate your life to see if you can actually do this to see if you'll be faithful. We're going to help you. We're going to teach you. You're going to listen. The, the grace of God, did Peter not deny the Lord and yet yeah. was given another chance? A true man of God can have a moment of failure, but what you do, what matters is what you do after that. When you fail, run to the one who set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. The God-man Jesus Christ who bore your sins on the cross and was crushed under the wrath of his Father in your place. He was unwavering. He was faithful. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again in glorious victory. The vindication that that sacrifice, that when we are faithless, he is faithful. And he ascended to the right hand of the Father, calls all men to repent and believe in him. If you trust in him, if you're not a believer, all your sin, all your failures, all of them can be forgiven by this one who set his face like flint to die for you. And if you have failed as a believer, even as a man or woman of God, he will be gracious to you. I'm going to end, and I promise I'll end. This, I started with a Spurgeon quote. I felt it appropriate to end with one. Spurgeon said, my great object is to lead you to love him who has so loved you that he set his face like a flint in his determination to save you. O ye redeemed ones on whose behalf this strong resolve was made, ye who have been bought by the precious blood of this steadfast, resolute redeemer, come and think a while of him that your hearts may burn within you and that your faces may be set like flint to live and to die for him who lived and died for you. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, I, I thank you for your grace. I even thank you for your discipline, Lord. I thank you that you love us enough to chastise us and to move us in the right directions when we have failed you. And even in your judgments, you are merciful. Lord, I pray that you would help us 
Help us to have faith like Flint today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.